He's the founder and CEO of the Self Worth Academy, as well as an internationally recognized speaker, author, and business coach. He's the author of four books. The most recent is The Self Worth Safari. You can get it on Amazon. It's called The Self Worth Safari The Courage to Ask, Hidden Value, and Opportunity Conversations. His favorite quote comes from the Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde quote that says, be yourself, everyone else is taken. So that's such a great uh, idea to go with. And now, John, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, my friend. Okay, I'm just going to share a screen and hope this works. Are we good? Yes, we're good. Good to go. Good to go. Super. As you were speaking earlier, Tracy, I wish I could time travel, you know, in a, in a perfect world where anything was possible. I would take my, uh, my younger self to today's talk if I could only have that gift of, of time traveling by about 10 to 20 years. Um, I would have been very interested to hear what you've just shared in that previous talk and also what Dan talked about earlier. Uh, I was so captured by one phrase he used when he said, um, you know, there's no shortage of bombs going off in today's world. What matters is how we respond to that challenge. And it's in that spirit, really, that I, I hope to uh, take you on a deep dive into this very central topic of self-worth over the next 20 minutes or so. Yep, there are bombs going off and there's all kinds of things happening. Um, for me, one of the most difficult years was 2016 which is four years ago now. In, in 2016, I was personally recovering from the end of a relationship. Uh, a business project had failed. Um, what else happened? There were certain political developments on both sides of the Atlantic that I don't think we want to talk about today. Um, the, one of the consequences of that was that uh, sterling dropped in value and a, a charity that, in which I'm very involved in Guatemala uh, lost a significant chunk of its funding because of exchange rate differences. Um, and on top of the day job, I was working with them to uh, sort that out. And while I was in Guatemala, uh, my mother had a heart attack and subsequently died. So when I got back to Brussels, where I was then living in, in Belgium, at the end of 2016, it, it had felt like, you know, the, one of the worst years of my life. And I don't know what happens to you in difficult times, but certainly in, in difficult times, my experience is that I have to learn fast. And one of the things that I'd learned was that um, one of the things that the experience that I had was a complete loss almost of identity. Uh, because the, the anchors upon which I'd based my life, uh, relationship, success, the, the conditions that you referred to earlier, uh, one by one were taken out. It was as if when one door closed, another one shut. Uh, you know, that was 2016, if you like, for me. And one of the things that confused me is that I had lived my life based on self-esteem. Now, Self-esteem is, is a good thing as far as it goes. The problem is the roots of self-esteem just didn't go down far enough. Um, self-esteem is like the plant, if you like, and, and self-worth is, is like the roots. And our society has been giving a lot of attention to self-esteem for quite a long time. And I had lived my life on the basis of self-esteem. Um, as a recovered Irish Catholic, that was already a step up on what had gone before. So, you know, it, it, it was progress. But in 2016, I discovered that those roots really did not go down far enough to survive what was a long drought. And I began to learn the truth of something that I had come across a few years earlier, but I was like a guy reading the recipe book, but without actually eating the dish. Um, uh, th this fundamental difference between self-worth and self-esteem, that self-worth, as you've just been describing, is inherent. It comes from within, not from performance or from achievement. And, and therefore, it's unconditional. And in that way, only when the roots go down below the level of conditions, then, then can we have uh, sustainable uh, confidence and sustainable self-esteem. Self-esteem fluctuates. You know, this is the this is the thing that I really learned in, in 2016. Uh, Self-esteem on a good day is up and on a day that I fall off my diet or things don't go according to plan, it, it can drop again. Uh, Self-esteem quite naturally uh, fluctuates. 
Uh, but self-worth, as you've just described with uh, the figure of 10, self-worth is always there. It, it's like the sun. The clouds may roll over, but the sunshine doesn't have to go away. And of course, that's crucially important in today's pandemic world, uh, because one of the immediate benefits of self-worth, um, even while um, I was still on, on the journey that eventually gave rise to this, and I, I did not set out to write a book, um, I, I set out to personally recover, uh, but um, what it, it, that grew into a little mini program and in, in, in turn it grew into a book. But one of the early benefits for me was, was a speedier recovery. And when there's a lot of setbacks around, we need that resilience. And one of the great gifts of self-worth is resilience. The second is productivity. Um, particularly in a team environment, when people have self-worth, they can get on with the job rather than chasing validation. Uh, rather than chasing their own opinion of themselves. And because of that, teamwork gets better. Because the, now we create the space for a sense of, of common purpose, as opposed to serving the ego of somebody. And most importantly, we create space to create opportunity. Because opportunity arises out of actually exploring how we can be useful to other people. And it's practically impossible to do that if we're obsessed with our own opinion of ourselves. Because we'll be proving ourselves, we'll be, we'll be chasing validation all of the time. And um, I do a lot of work these days with sales teams. And, and this, is, um, this fourth uh, part is very important. And so is the fifth, because out of that opportunity focus, rather than look at me focus, then we can be truly creative. Then we can explore what is it in the world that, uh, that needs, needs us, that needs our, our skills, and how can we be useful to them. So the brief today is to focus on how to do that. Now, I cannot possibly summarize, you know, a, a year plus of work and about 300 pages in, in 10 tips, but I'm going to have a go. Um, and if I speak too quickly uh, with the accent being Irish, um, you might just have to interrupt me and, and, and tell me to slow down. But um, self-worth is very evident in how we begin things. And one of the practices that's in the morning routine, uh, that, that's uh, in the book here, is as your feet touch the floor in the morning, uh, assuming you're getting out of bed in the morning as opposed to something else, but as your feet touch the floor, this is a moment to affirm your self-worth. And, and the working definition that we use in the book is self-worth is your loyal friendship with yourself with no conditions. So as your feet hit the floor in the morning, before the day begins, before you open emails, before anything happens, can we at least start the day with a sense of unconditional friendship with ourselves? And if you want some kind of affirmation to go with that, by all means, create your own. There's plenty of suggestions in the book, uh, plus examples. But um, a simple one might simply be an assertion that you're going to be on your own side today, no matter what happens. The um, second tip is to, to drop the self-assessments, and I don't just mean the negative ones. Um, one of the characteristics you've spoken about, uh, Tracy, is this characteristic of being self-critical. Uh, but it, it goes, um, this isn't just about the negative self-assessments. Actually, our addiction to the positive ones are part of the problem. So when we're working with individuals and working with teams, we, we spend a lot of time, and in fact, the first shift in the program is about identifying and becoming aware of these self-assessments that often cloud our days. Um, and um, the, the cartoon in the middle sums up the problem with, uh, with endless self-assessment. Look, they're, they're only labels, um, these adjectives. Uh, it's better if we move to assertions um, as already described instead. And then following the day through, um, assuming that many people, and uh, not everyone exercises in the morning, but many people do. Personally, I prefer to do it in the afternoon, but hey. Um, when you're exercising, this is a good moment to check your intention behind, the, behind your exercising. Are you exercising to prove something to yourself? So I'm a, a long distance runner, so I'm you know, I every time I ran a half marathon, it had to be faster than the last one. You know, guess what? Um, this was my very much my self esteem thinking. Um, am I doing that as a condition of self esteem, or am I doing it as an expression of self worth? 
uh, our intention is incredibly important. Uh, our attention will always follow our intention. So if our intention is proving ourselves, if our intention is uh, to, th to validate ourselves in some way, then that intention is going to flow through everything that we do. And it's going to come across in our meetings uh, later later in the day. So it's a good opportunity to check your intention. Uh, obviously, you can do that in meetings too, but um, exercise is a, is a pretty useful place to begin. Building on that, <clears throat> so you're off to do a meeting with one of your managers or you're off to do a, a meeting with a potential uh, new hire. I see there's a session coming up on that. What's your intention as you go into that meeting? Are you trying to be interesting, self-esteem? Or are you interested in them and how they tick self-worth? Um, again, one of the distinct, probably one of the most popular shifts in the book is the shift from being interesting to interested. Um, we, we live in a pandemic of, of self-esteem uh, preoccupation. Um, very often symptomatic of low self-worth in precisely the ways that you've just been talking about, Tracy. And, the problem with low self-worth is it craves validation all the time and therefore I have to be interesting all the time. So every time something doesn't go well in the meeting, somebody cuts me, cuts me up in traffic or whatever, I might somehow be put down. That's very much self-esteem thinking, um, the sensitivity to that. If instead we're interested, that really transforms meetings, even difficult meetings. Uh, when we can enter the meeting with that with that spirit. Now, um, as you've mentioned earlier, um, you know we, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world where we have to deal with problems, and there's been plenty of them this year uh, coming our way. Um, bombs going off, as Dan would have put it uh, earlier. One of the one of the uh, questions that can help us to to come at things from a self worth perspective would be asking. Okay, in this difficult situation, what can I do that would be most useful? Rather than, again, how am I coming across? Or self-evaluating or worse still, self-justifying uh, for the situation in the first place. Um, this is not only helpful for leaders, it's also very helpful for people in customer service, for people who have to deal with clients, uh, for project managers. Uh, the focus on usefulness, uh, somehow people pick up on that within 60 seconds. Um, and when we are in a difficult situation and when we're doing our best to solve a problem, the very fact that we're focused on usefulness rather than self-justification, uh, that transmits itself very quickly. I'm going to, um, I'm just doing a quick time check here. I'm going to do a little interlude for a second on, on um, one of the ways, uh, one of the shifts in the book is from self-evaluation to usefulness. You, you'll see we're dead against the labeling that goes with, um, uh, with, um, uh, with self-evaluation and continuous assessment. Uh, this habit of continuous assessment, of self-assessment, actually causes a lot of problems. Um, if we look at somebody with, with um, let's say, with, that, that's driven by self-esteem, uh, who is, who is, who needs the validation all the time? Then, for them, the world is just raw material. You know, the the world is there to answer the perennial question: How am I doing? Whereas, when somebody has self worth, they go out in the morning already okay with themselves. So they go out into the world asking, "What can I do?" Or they go out into the world asking, "How can I be interested?" And of course, that in itself is a wonderful escape from fear and into freedom. Um, there's no insecurity when we're asking, what can I do or how can I be useful? Moving on with the tips. Um, leaders make mistakes, right? Yes, we do. Um, when we make mistakes, the interesting thing is what happens next. Do we play the blame game, trying to figure out who went wrong? Or do we focus on what went wrong? Again, with self-worth, that gives us the freedom to focus on where was the problem. You know, what could have been different versus who made the mistake and who can now be blamed. 
We have a, an entire course on dealing with difficult people. It's one of the more popular ones. Um, the, um, I'm always been captivated by my fellow countryman, George Bernard Shaw, who, um, I, in fact, I had this on the fridge for years before I lost the fridge magnet in a, in a recent move. Uh, but the, on the fridge, it used to say, never wrestle with the pig. Um, you'll get dirty. And besides, the pig likes it. And, and the reason it was on my fridge is I needed daily reminders of this, because again, from a, from a self-esteem preoccupation, it is, of course, very easily to find ourselves wrestling with pigs. Um, I love what you were saying earlier, Tracy, about just don't hire people who are, who are low on self-worth. This is a great way of preventing ourselves uh, dealing with uh, too many uh, wrestling with pig uh, situations. Um, Another tip that has been very helpful uh, in our development over the last year in particular is, is making space for um, collective intelligence. And, and this again presupposes a degree of self-worth because to really make space for collective brainstorming, it, you have to empower or at least acknowledge the power uh, of the people around you. Uh, and uh, if, if we're trying to control that, then it's impossible to have that kind of honest brainstorming. So when it's difficult, when it's not easy to see the way ahead, when, you know, when it looks as if m many roads are blocked, uh, again, when if one door is closing and another one is shutting uh, rather than opening, uh, then sometimes uh, one of the things we can do, uh, one of the ways we can practice self-worth is by making space for collective intelligence. And when we're communicating that, and when we're communi communicating uh, how we set it up, then to begin with why, to begin with a sense of purpose, um, why are we doing that? And looking out for um, it being a common purpose rather than an individual purpose. Self-esteem driven people are very much full of their individual purposes that they then seek to project outwards. With self-worth, we actually begin to, um, to find the common purpose. And this is very helpful when you're recruiting. Um, one of my favorite interview questions is just um, asking people to describe some of their achievements. But yes, I'm listening to what they say, but above all, I'm listening to how they tell the story. Are they telling a story where they rode in like John Wayne with guns blazing and solve the problem when everybody else was simply a supporting cast or sometimes a passenger in their ego trip? Um, or are they telling a story where a team worked together and they played their part in that team in order to overcome a challenge or to create success? Um, the great thing that you get with self-worth is you get people who are able to think in terms of common purpose. As Tracy mentioned, I do a lot of coaching in this area, uh, in fact, always have. Um, and the, the three, the three um, forms of words I'm constantly looking out for are the words I should, I must, and I have to. Uh, it doesn't just happen with leaders, it happens with professionals, it happens with um, advisors, consultants, all manner of, of professionals are, are full of the I should, I must, and I have to. This again is the language of imperative. It is indeed, of course, also often the language of fear. Um, it, it's like that self-esteem driver that their parents installed in them when they were uh, school kids so that they would continue to beat themselves up when the parent wasn't around. Uh, I should, I must, and I have to. And we, we, we seek to change, you know, call attention to that language in coaching and, and to encourage people to change the shoulds into coulds. And out of that, you get creativity. Uh, out of that, you get uh, a new sense of possibility and regeneration, and you certainly get uh, fresh ideas. For all the reasons already beautifully described by Tracy, you know, this is ab above ever. This is a time when we need our inner compass. We need the freedom from our own reputation with ourselves. You know, that there's more exciting things to do in town than chasing our own reputation with ourselves. And as a leader in times of crisis, um, this is quite important. So the shifts become a shift, if you like, instead of trying to prove ourselves as the leader, instead to valuing ourselves and also the contribution of others. 
Uh, Self-esteem uh, is often driven by the need to be right, um, particularly in certain professions where being right and being the expert is, is so important. Uh, with self-worth, we can step beyond that and we are free to be useful rather than just to be right. Um, Self-esteem driven is very often uh, driven by conditional praise and reward. I mean, just look at all those 360 appraisal systems, hanging adjectives all over the shop. Uh, Self-worth um, seeks to motivate others by calling attention to, first of all, appreciation, and also to a loyalty towards a common purpose and contribution towards a common purpose, or Ubuntu as a phrase that I now have after, uh, after today. Um, one of the drawings in the book, one of the, it, it, it's the, the humorous uh, definition, but ironically, it's often this one that is remembered by many people who have read the book. That self-esteem is walking down the street as if you owned it, and self-worth is walking down the street, and frankly, it doesn't matter who owns it. And I uh, particularly like that uh, interpretation. Uh, and it's in that spirit that I share a reflection question with you today that I often use in coaching work at Self-Worth Academy, um, but also even in casual conversation, which is what would you do or perhaps not do sometimes? Because um, it's not always about more action. Sometimes it's about less. If you had nothing to prove to yourself, because with self-esteem, the self is the tyrant. Um, many of us left behind what we were proving to other people uh, early on, but what was still, um, that what was the tyrant in my days, still in my early 50s, was, was the tyrant that was in my head, the person that I had to be constantly impressing um, in my head, needing to prove things uh, to myself. And the fruits of that um, reflection uh, often unlocks a lot of joy and a lot of lightness and a lot of freedom for people. Um, the book opens with that beautiful quote from T.S. Eliot uh, that the end of all our exploring will be to arrive back where we started but knowing the place for the very first time. And if this talk has even invited you onto that uh, adventure, then you're already on Self-Worth Safari. Thank you for the invitation.